Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Heritage School of Governance. Uh, my name is Başak Çalı. I'm a professor of international law here, and I will be moderating the event uh, today on technology and the next frontier in human rights. Uh, this event is organized uh, together with the Digital Rights Fund uh, based in Berlin, uh, which actually provides support for strategic litigation in the field of human rights. And we started to talk about this event. It was a very cold November uh, evening, and we were talking about how there were so many different layers of issues when it came to technology and human rights. Uh, you couldn't really narrow it down to one issue. Now, some of these issues are brand new, and we don't really have answers. And the others are uh, not new issues, uh, but they do require new answers. So the first sort of the brand new issue is, of course, the relationship between uh, whatever you want to call it, the uh, automation or algorithms, and how it affects our enjoyment of rights, the protection of rights regimes. There are not necessarily very clear answers on how we deal with what absolutely new technology brings to us. Another new issue is whether we're divided into new types of citizens, those who have access uh, to technology and those who don't have access uh, to it, or those who are defined by technology and those who are not uh, defined by it. These are all very new issues for us. But there are lots of old issues. What, what is one of the old issues that news, uh, really needs a new answer is the relationship between corporate actors' roles in protection of human rights and the state actors. Now, this is not a new issue. You could say there are lots of other offline issues, but in the digital world, this is a new uh, challenge about how we balance Facebook versus the state or the Twitter versus government uh, regulation. Another old issue is who governs? Is it the state, uh, the regional organizations, the Council of Europe, the United Nations, um, code of conduct uh, by a bunch of uh, corporate regulators? And these are all issues, but the technology makes these a lot more complicated. Uh, so we hope to be able to touch on some of these uh, issues today. Uh, and I'm uh, absolutely excited because I have an excellent lineup uh, of speakers. And of course, you know, people who present these events always talk about excellent lineup of speakers. But I think um, uh, I think I'm absolutely uh, spot on with this one. So uh, I have amazing uh, speakers with incredible wealth of expertise on all of these ranges of issues. Uh, my first uh, speaker today, who would actually be giving an opening uh, keynote uh, on, on, on various issues, is Dunja Mijatovic. Uh, Dunja Mijatovic is currently uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights for Council of Europe. She assumed this role on the 1st of April. And I'm very pleased to say this is her first public engagement at a university as a commissioner. Of course, she has had uh, millions of other engagements in the past. And uh, Dunja uh, has worked on freedom of expression issues with the OSCE. She was the representative on uh, media freedom at the OSCE, but she also worked uh, on freedom of expression related issues in the digital environment in Bosnia-Herzegovina and also regionally uh, within, within Europe for a, an incredible amount of years. So she's bringing us not the voice of a commissioner, uh, but the experience uh, of a human rights worker in these fields. After we hear from Dunja, I have two uh, panelists who will debate uh, some of these challenges, the next frontier in human rights challenges. So my first speaker is uh, Samantha Bradshaw. Uh, Samantha is coming uh, over from uh, the Oxford Internet Institute and she works for the Oxford Computational, help me here. This is the challenge. I was, I was saying I have to practice this computational propaganda project. Now, the computational propaganda project is investigating the relationship between algorithms, big data, automation, and public policy, public life, and politics. So she's going to bring us a lot of wealth of expertise uh, from, from this research. She's also a researcher in, in many other fields. She has written a lot about these issues. Her work appeared in places like the Financial Times. She just had a big interview with the BBC, so we're really looking forward to hearing from you. And now my second uh, panelist on the, on the panel that we will do uh, later on is Nani Jansen-Reventlow, and she is the director of Digital Rights Fund. She comes here with a wealth 
of experience in strategic litigation for freedom of expression, both online and offline. And maybe we will come back to the online and the offline uh, distinctions later. She's litigated in various jurisdictions, in various regional courts uh, before the United Nations and also domestically. She's a tenant at the Doughty Street um, uh, chamber in London, and uh, she has also uh, been a fellow at Harvard uh, focusing on uh, internet and society in the past. So I'm bringing you uh, very different perspectives, but a huge wealth of experience on these cutting edge questions. So uh, let me first welcome Dunya for her opening speech and thank her to choose for choosing Harty uh, as the commissioner's first university engagement as well. Thank you, Dunya. Thank you, Pasek. Thank you, Herty School of Governance. It's a great honor uh, and pleasure to be here. But I also have to say that um, when I said yes to Herty School and to Nani, um, I didn't have institutional hat that I'm wearing now. Uh, when I decided to be a friend uh, of Digital Fund Foundation, um, I just left the OSC. And I was trying to see what are the new challenges and how I can use my expertise and everything I did uh, in the past, including the OSC work, um, in my future work. And then it came. Uh, I was elected uh, Council of Europe uh, Commissioner for Human Rights in January this year. And then, in order to keep the promise, uh, to uh, Nani and to Herty School, I said, yes, I'm going to come. And it is very much connected, intertwined, interrelated, everything we do at the Council of Europe uh, and everything that we are trying to raise here today. I'll try to be concise, um, brief. I'm not going to bore you with too many things that you already know. Um, I'm going to try to pose several questions uh, that I think are important to our topic today, um, and also to engage uh, later on and to listen to uh, your um, discussion. Um, I think it's also quite important that I'm here as the newly elected uh, Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, because of the topic we are discussing here today. I see uh, digital rights, human rights online, and all the channel challenges we are facing uh, as something of uh, great importance, uh, if not crucial. I think it's a new frontier for human rights. Um, new technology opportunities available to the diverse spectrum uh, of actors in the human rights ecosystem have endangered much deserved enthusiasm in my view. Technology um, is foundational and it's re actually entering uh, throughout the modern day in human rights movements. There exist tremendous opportunities to advance human rights efforts with the uh, aid of a myriad of technology tools, but there is also a growing need to ensure the safety and security of activists, human rights defenders, and everyday citizens in the world of globalized surveillance. In my previous work uh, at the OSC, I work with uh, bloggers, uh, journalists, human rights defenders uh, that were um, in danger, uh, mainly because of uh, actions from their governments, people who were imprisoned, uh, tortured, and sometimes killed because of the work they were there doing, because of journalism, because of free expression, uh, because of their right to engage in everyday discourse. And that was challenged and uh, in the, with the most horrifying uh, ways of uh, suppressing uh, free speech. And then this is happening in the ordinary life and then we move to cyberspace and we see exactly the same we see copy-paste um, actions and uh, um, attempts to suppress, to restrict differing voices, dissenting voices, critical voices, provocative voices, and the tools that are used 
are something that we need to pay attention to and to, to look at, uh, not just here, but at the international organizations, including um, civil society, governments, in academia. Understanding uh, the technical, legal, and political infrastructure affecting rights in the digital sphere is uh, pivotal to ensure all human rights are upheld in a world when boundaries between the digital and physical space are increasingly blurred. There is a sense of urgency to enhance the capacity of the human rights movement to monitor and hold to account abusers who violate rights in the physical world and online. Uh, this entails use of technology to monitor uh, and build evidence of abuses, as well as promoting policies for technical infrastructure that protect basic rights. Our lives are moving online more and more. The line between offline and online has blurred completely, if ever it <laughs> even existed at all. And the reason for concern and to pay extra attention to this is that I think we somehow neglected uh, all the problems and everything that was awaiting around the corner and didn't pay too much attention with all the benefits that were coming from this uh, new world. What I would also like uh, to mention is um, the fact that we are now discussing um, the frontiers uh, of uh, um, the new frontiers of human rights in um, the new world and uh, with the new technologies and everything that is around the corner. How are we going to tackle all these problems and at the same time not uh, affect or restrict our basic human rights? It is a big question that uh, many of us are trying to answer but it seems to me as well um, that we are not very successful. So the attempts uh, today and also everything that um, NANI's Digital Foundation Fund is doing is of a great importance for the well-being of our society. There is a lack of education, I would say. Internet literacy is something that in many states I think we failed in this attempt to educate uh, uh, the citizens. And this is all creating uh, many problems. Um, after decades of um, unbridled enthusiasm, bordering on addiction, I would say, uh, about all things digital, the public may be losing trust uh, in technology. And we are somehow facing uh, or facing um, something that I would even call a fatigue. Um, digital fatigue or technological fatigue. Um, online information isn't reliable, whether it appears in the form of news, um, search results, or user reviews. Uh, social media in particular is vulnerable to manipulation by hackers or foreign powers. I'm not going to mention cases uh, today, uh, but of course I would be very much uh, uh, ready to answer any questions you might have. Uh, personal data isn't uh, necessarily private, and people are increasingly worried about automation and artificial intelligence taking humans' jobs. Yet around the world, people are both increasingly dependent on and distrustful of digital technology. They don't uh, behave as if they mistrust technology. Instead, people are using technological tools more intensively in all aspects of daily life. And we might ask ourselves, why is this happening? Um, at the same time, you have this uh, fatigue or um, fear from technology, and then you have more and more people um, online. Um, in today's technology, giants don't do anything or they do too little to address uh, this unease in an environment of growing dependence. People might start looking for more trustworthy companies and systems to use. Many scholars are stating this, um, but I doubt very much. Um, some of the concerns have to do with how big a role uh, is of the technology companies and the products uh, they play in people's life. 
and 90% of search um, queries worldwide go through Google, according to the latest data. And um, technical stocks are booming in ways um, that are reminding us of the days of a dot-com bubble in 1997 to 2001 with emerging technologies including the Internet of Things, self-driving cars, blockchain systems and artificial intelligence, tempting investors and entrepreneurs to reach and um, power the industry, uh, and, is that, and that industry is only likely uh, to grow. So with all this, um, we are facing a situation where we try to look at the issue of harassment, diversity, and everything that is affecting our online world. Uh, if you look at uh, the situation in um, many of the countries that cannot be called democrat democracies, you see that there are more and more attempts to block and to restrict everything that is happening online. From access to information to expressing the views, not to mention uh, challenging powerful uh, in the society. Um, what actually happened is uh, in Europe um, recently, we had two um, murders of um, journalists that were actually performing investigative journalism online as well, um, and using online tools as well in order to engage with uh, uh, their sources and to write the stories. They were killed. One is, uh, uh, one is killed in Slovakia, the other one in Malta. And those two murders are first murders of uh, journalists in the European Union since the murder of Veronica Garin uh, in Ireland many years ago. And what is known by now is that online tools and online engagement they were using were also ways to track them and to harass them constantly by different actors. Uh, so when it comes to security of speech, of investigative stories, of everything that bloggers and uh, human rights defenders are using as a tools, is also something that uh, there is a big question mark and we are trying uh, to see how this can be tackled without suppressing freedom of expression and uh, freedom uh, of speech. Uh, I think there is a way to improve the situation uh, and the awareness and understanding uh, of the whole problem. And one of the ways I think it's um, very much related to uh, what Nani uh, is doing with her uh, fund, um, from litigations to raising the awareness and discussing these uh, issues, not just uh, um, with governments and civil society, but also engaging academia uh, in the story, because I think there is uh, quite um, a loop, uh, a gap, when it comes to the engagement of academia in everything that is related to uh, technology and uh, um, digital uh, rights and human rights uh, uh, that we are trying to perform um, online. We are not lacking um, resolutions. We are not lacking uh, documents on the, in the international organizations. There are wonderful uh, texts and um, words on paper adopted by many governments, democratic and not democratic around the world. But if we look at the implementation, if we look how those instruments that we have at our disposal are used, um, then we have a problem. Then we see that there is almost zero implementation or lack of understanding uh, when it comes to these uh, uh, issues. When it comes to the Council of Europe, I must say that we are quite advanced when it comes to um, producing uh, very important documents. And we brought uh, today um, two publications uh, that is uh, just um, put on that table um, in, in order to uh, use it as a bit of propaganda about the work of the Council of Europe, but also um, to see that the engagement um, that many international organizations are um, 
entering uh, is really showing that there is an understanding that we need to move forward and we need to do things in order to protect our life uh, online, to protect diversity, to protect free speech, to protect basic um, human rights uh, that is definitely uh, suffering uh, in, in these uh, times of uh, great anxiety and fear within our societies. Um, the documents I would uh, like to mention um, uh, and uh, some recommendations that I think are quite uh, important are a publication that is entitled Algorithms and Human Rights. Uh, that is a study on human rights dimension of automated data processing techniques and possible regulatory implications identified a number of human rights concerns triggered by the increasing role of algorithms in decision making. It notably stresses that a search algorithm might be biased towards certain types of content or content providers, thereby risking affecting related values such as media pluralism and diversity. Another key human right that is frequently cited in relations to the operation of algorithms and other um, automated processing techniques is the right to enjoy all human rights and fundamental freedoms without discrimination. The Council of Europe Committee of Ministers adopted last year the recommendation on big data for culture, literacy and democracy, which states inter alia that everyone can choose to be <coughs> sorry, in the digital age and therefore do not have predictions made by algorithms about one's cultural attributes, preferences and behaviors. And there are many other documents uh, that I'm not going to, to mention here today. But this is just, you know, a few um, information about the need, um, the attempt, and the action that is taking part in the international organizations. Also, the engagement with uh, bloggers, human rights defenders, journalists that are working online more and more is something that is of uh, crucial importance. But at the same time, um, this, uh, I, I called, uh, called it at the beginning fatigue, um, is also present in this area of engagement. There are more and more journalists that are actually deciding not to engage online because of surveillance, because of possibility for, uh, for them to be tracked. And then also the tools they are using are changing, changing constantly. And this is something that we receive on a daily basis, and this is something that I engaged also in my previous role as the OSC representative on freedom of the media, trying to tackle these problems. And I must say that we are not, I have to be very honest with you, I do not think we are successful enough. There are more and more people that are suffering, that are suffering because of no possibilities to protect them. And also no willingness from many governments in order to uh, investigate attacks, to see how these digital rights can also be protected in, in our online world. Um, and the, the need to join our voices and our forces is of crucial um, importance. Here I would stop and um, give the floor to my colleagues and also engage later on in any discussion or any question that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dunya. We, uh, we started on a sort of a negative, uh, or not, not a very high note. Uh, let's see where we get uh, from there uh, with, with our conversation now. So what, one, of the, one of the core issues with technology and the next frontier in human rights is that technology is a moving target. <laughs> It's, it's not something that we could sort of regulate a, a particular issue today and then tomorrow that will be done and we have had some regulatory uh, sort of uh, solutions for an issue, but it is constantly changing and there are, there are the, uh, conversations about what happens today, what will happen in the immediate future, and what will happen in the midterm, uh, 
and there are not the same kind of challenges. Uh, so this is the kind of the, the thing I want to focus on here. And first, I'd like to start uh, with you, Samantha, and actually ask you about challenges that we have today and maybe in the, in the very, very uh, immediate future about what are the issues that you think are at the frontier uh, when you look at it from this sort of a very short-term perspective. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I think, you know, when we're looking, reading the news cycle, Cambridge Analytica, fake news, all of that stuff going on with Facebook collecting and monetizing our personal data and selling it to politicians uh, who will um, use this information to develop detailed voter profiles of who we are as citizens and target us with very specific messages that, you know, polarize us and separate us um, from people who might be different than us um, instead of, you know, bringing us together in, in a way that um, allows us to have healthy conversations about politics online. I think these are some of the biggest challenges. Um, and there's very little transparency around how this data collection actually works. Um, and also around how the targeting works. And you know, in, in Europe and North America, well, Europe mainly, there are some data protection laws that are coming, so GDPR, um, that will start setting some limits. Um, and European regulators are really starting to think about these issues. But you know, in the United States and North America more broadly, there is very little data protection regulations. And then if you think of other developing countries, like the Philippines or Brazil or any of those other places, um, they're going to be even more susceptible to um, these kinds of operations happening on social media. The Philippines, for example, most people online, they connect through zero-rated programs, which means they can access the internet for free via their mobile phones because a lot of them can't afford to actually pay for data plans. Um, but that means that their whole internet experience is through Facebook. So they can't fact check information like we can. We can't, they can't check the source of where this messaging is coming from. And so you get leaders like President Duterte who has very successfully leverage social media to come into power and then exercise control over his population. Okay, so there's there's quite a there's a quite a there's a, no there's quite a, <laughs> a, a, a range of issues here, uh, and uh, thank you for distinguishing between different places and where where we are up in in relation to that sort of regulation of data harvesting and where it can happen and where it can be used and cannot be used. So Nina, what keeps you up at night uh, these days when you think about technology and and human rights uh, in and around um, our our current current situation and maybe a little bit into the future? What keeps me up at night at the moment is uh, generally the way in which we are um, allowing for our human rights to be eroded in the digital sphere. Um, I like to say that I, I kind of think that we're all kind of asleep at the wheel uh, at the moment. Um, many of our human rights that we've fought for, uh, for a pretty long time, right to freedom of expression, right to privacy, right to vote, um, are slowly, slowly being eroded uh, when it comes uh, to the exercise of those rights in the digital context. Um, and by that, I do not only mean um, insufficient resistance, if I can call it that, uh, to uh, invasive government surveillance laws, but also the way in which we as consumers uh, voluntarily give up our rights when it comes to corporations, right? We've all accepted the terms and conditions uh, fairly easily to use a free app uh, or a free service um, without really thinking of the implications. Um, and I think that that is a very worrying trend. Uh, we're basically trading off short-term convenience for longer-term erosion of human rights uh, without really thinking what those data, which are all being held somewhere out there, could do in the longer term when they fall in the hands of someone who might use them or abuse them uh, to certain ends. And, and that is a thing that I find uh, very worrying. So take us to a little bit maybe Hang on, we'll, we'll get to some other uh, high points. Bear with me. Uh, take us to a little bit to the, to the future. Uh, not, not everyone uh, knows about what is coming. You know, we, we say the robots are coming or algorithms are already here. 
and you know whatever else is and and as you see I'm struggling I, I couldn't even say computational uh, you know in, a, in one go so I'm behind uh, all, all of these things already right so when you look at sort of a, a lot more of a longer term thing there are lots of risks but what are the future risks that we don't even know about as, as maybe uh, publics um, around the world yeah, so um, there are kind of two big topics, I think, that we're thinking about at Oxford on the Computational Propaganda Project. Um, the first and obvious one is artificial intelligence and how that's going to change our entire media landscape. Um, so I don't know if anyone here has heard of deep fakes. Um, Make sure you're careful when you Google it, um, because a lot of it is <laughs> used um, in pornography. But essentially, what it does is it takes um, you know my face and can put it on any video out there. Um, and so there's really funny like Nicolas Cage YouTube videos of his face being put in other movie scenes and whatnot. Um, but to me, when I watch that. I see this as a new tool of propaganda, where imagine taking Obama's face and putting it on a video and then altering the voice so that he's saying something that he never actually said, and then putting that out in social media and getting people to share that throughout their networks. Um, and video especially, it's, it's something that's a little bit more um, emotive. When we see it, it's different than reading a, a fake news headline. Um, you know, once you see something, it's hard to unsee it. So the power behind that kind of technology in disseminating propaganda is one thing um, that, that worries me. The second um, area would be the Internet of Things. And a lot of people don't necessarily make that connection right away between the Internet of Things and propaganda. But there's going to be what, like 20 billion new things connected to the internet by 2020, and a lot of these are going to be sensors um, and body sensors, so things that could track my heart rate, um, could track my, my emotions, depending on like different body measurements. Um, and now imagine taking that and using that in addition to my social media feed and seeing the kinds of emotional reactions that I'm having to whatever I'm reading or watching at the time, that also has the power to fine tune the messages that we're delivering to people online. And so AI and Internet of Things, two big issues for me in the future. Thank you. Um, what about you, Nani? Well, robots scare me for sure. Um, we had um, a very interesting question at some point at the Bergman Klein Center about whether or not you should be nice to robots. Now it's like, err on the side of caution, be nice. One, one day they might be in charge. Um, but uh, slightly more uh, concrete <laughs> right now. Um, what worries me very much when I think about the future is what kind of society we will have um, when uh, looking at issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, and by that, um, I mean that I'm very worried about technological design and engineering and how this replicates uh, the faulty power structures that we basically have in our society right now. If you look at the way that our current technology is being designed and engineered, it's a very small group of people, uh, generally affluent, generally white, generally male, that that takes care of all of this. And we tend to kind of like, you know, like to adhere to the illusion that technology is neutral, but it is not, right? Every single step in engineering and in designing entails a choice. And when those choices reflect the worldview of a very narrow set of people, uh, those choices will be replicated and reinforced in the way that the technology actually uh, applies in practice. And you see these kind of like semi-funny uh, anecdotal examples of that coming out, you know, um, camera software that um, uh, flags uh, Asian people as blinking. But then there's also uh, things that kind of show a more nefarious uh, effect, right? Um, one of the things that came out recently was um, that uh, Amazon's next day delivery service wasn't offered in areas that actually correspond with the uh, now you know, a nefarious uh, 1930s redlining zones. So those were the zones that were designated as being high risk uh, for mortgages uh, by the US uh, in the 1930s, based on um, factors of ethnicity and race. And those things, I think, are, are very, very concerning. Not only because, um, you know, you see those now in kind of consumer technology, but it's also because law enforcement is using 
and leaning on more and more on that type of technology to facilitate their work. Um, there's this kind of um, tagline which is called garbage in, garbage out, right? When you deal with, with techno technology and when you deal with uh, self-learning algorithms, uh, rhythms, etc. The idea that the people who are feeding data into certain programs aren't thinking that the data they're feeding it might not actually reflect an accurate worldview. Once that gets reinforced by self-learning systems, that becomes very, very troublesome. So that worries me. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I am learning a, a huge amount of, of new worries and concerns. I did have some very simple ones, now I realize. Uh, I think I ought to worry even more. Um, so let's come to two, a, a double question. You know, they're, they're always the good ones, right? To ask you two questions at the same time. Uh, one is, what are you doing? Uh, personally, as a researcher, uh, as a as a as somebody who engages the public uh, on these issues as well, in relation to these issues that you've identified, so because you know you're, we're we're kind of feeling almost helpless with with this type of information coming into us, and um, and the second thing, uh, the the thing is, what is your take on the the regulatory? Uh, kind of options that are on the table. So um, uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg has put a Facebook uh, post telling people what he did and what he didn't do, which I thought as a lawyer, you know, that's not accountability exactly. So there are lots of different models, right? He just put a Facebook post and, and you know, he was considering whether to give evidence and things like that. So there are lots of issues about what options do we have. Do we have options, uh, actually? So uh, you've given me a lot of uh, negative scenarios. So how do you turn those around? Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's an, an easy answer. I mean, social media is you know built on the network effect. So the more people that join these platforms, the more powerful and useful they become um, because of all the connections. And we're at that point right now where I, it is an incredibly valuable thing to be able to reach out to family and friends that you haven't seen in a while or that are on the other side of the world to organize events. Um, you know, Facebook now has a marketplace feature. Like, it's really becoming integral to our lives, and it's very hard to give up. Um, but on the regulatory side, um, there are about uh, 24 different governments right now around the world that have used fake news as a reason to create new legislation to address these problems. Some of them are done in more good faith. We, we could talk about Germany's Network Enforcement Act, which of course has a lot of downsides and negative effects on freedom of expression. Um, but other countries like Russia has pretty much done a copy and paste of this law to use it to legitimize their actions and um, their, their use of technology as a tool of social control and of repression on their own societies. Um, so, you know, I, I wish I could make this conversation more positive, but <laughs> I don't know if I can yet. You know, I, I think it's really exciting to see governments um, starting to think about these issues and engaging with platforms and platforms also engaging with governments to talk about how to solve these issues because they're not going, I don't think we can leave it just up to the platforms to fix. They sort of had their, their opportunity and, and they dropped the ball big time there. Um, so there needs to be some some kind of governmental role, whether that's more accountability and transparency around the algorithms, um, whether that's just setting up more opportunities to have these discussions so that we can come to better answers. Um, I think all of that is really positive and really necessary. Um, you know, with every shift in technology and communication technology in particular, there's been these difficult times where um, society has been like, oh my God, what is this doing? You know, with the printing press um, and tabloidization and then with the radio and um, then with TV and, and, and so on. Everyone has, you know, always looked at the negative sides of this technology and talked about how it could be used for, for bad purposes. Um, and it's taken a while, it always takes a while to come up with laws to then suppress some of that, uh, some of those more negative aspects. And I think we're just in that difficult learning phase right now where we're trying to figure out exactly what 
social media is doing to our society, and then governments then can step in and do something about it. Now, you're litigating, or you, you're, you would like to support people to strategically litigate for, for, for these range of concerns. I will ask you the same questions, but I have another one, maybe a little, uh, a, a, you know, a third one there. Uh, you know, there are usually two types of uh, litigation strategies or, or argumentation with new things. You could say ban that thing. That thing cannot be sustained. You can't just do damage management. We have this, this debate with, for example, autonomous weapons systems. Some people say they should be banned. And some others say, well, let's use it. Let's, let's, let's use them first. And then let's see, you know, we can maybe damage, you know, we can manage, you know, what the damages are in relation to these things. So with all of these concerns that you were uh, highlighting uh, to us, are there certain things that should not be used? Do we have to say the technological use of these issues uh, should not be allowed at all? Um, or are you saying, well, you know, let's see what, um, how we can make them better or, you know, make them work for us? I'm not entirely sure I, I followed the last bit of the question. Um, but let me try to first start with uh, saying what, 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 we, what we do. Uh, so we support uh, strategic litigation on digital rights in Europe, meaning that we don't litigate ourselves, but that we provide financial and other types of support to those who want to undertake strategic cases to advance digital rights uh, in Europe. And by that we mean Council of Europe, Europe, so big Europe. Uh, and, by st and by strategic, we mean uh, cases that have the potential of um, yielding an impact that goes beyond the individual issue at, at stake in the, in the individual case. Um, so we at the moment have kind of three thematic focus areas, uh, which deal with, with privacy, with freedom of expression, and also with the use of technology. Uh, so that kind of ties in with algorithmic decision making and, and things like that. But we're open to other issues uh, as well. Um, as regards what should and should not be litigated, is that what you were asking me? Or I'm, I'm trying to kind of... I'm, I'm, just, I'm just sort of worried that sometimes, you know, when we litigate, we litigate uh, to, to kind of say that, oh, this technology created negative effects and this should be addressed. Uh, but there's an additional question about whether we should be using this predictive uh, technologies or algorithms in the first place. Uh, and usually, you know, we, we, we as lawyers, we're looking at more improving things rather than maybe saying this can't, this should not take place in the first place. I think there's actually no turning the tide anymore. Uh, to be quite to be quite realistic about like wh what uh, saying that you can't use something, I don't think that I think we've kind of crossed that that bridge. What I do think is very important is that we make sure that this technology gets used in a way that there's sufficient uh, accountability and respect for human rights in that context. And I think that that is exactly the point. And it's actually not a marginal issue. It's a really big issue because. Um, well, the same way that indeed like the online context, as you just pointed out, is being used to kind of often reintroduce really oppressive legislation for freedom of expression, for example. Many countries have used the excuse of online publication and cybercrime, etc., to kind of reintroduce egregious penalties for defamation, for example, just because it happens online or for fake news, if it's like a, a, as a convenient new label. Similar things you see with the label of terrorism, for example. Oh, we, we, should be allowed all these broad surveillance powers because we're fighting terrorists. Um, but it's there exactly that the hard questions have to be asked. Like exactly what is the leeway that you should be giving to the authorities and to the and other parties that use such technology? And how can you make sure that they're held accountable uh, and sufficiently respect human rights in their operations? Okay, so uh, you see how backward I am in the in the conversation because I was thinking, oh, well, we could ban some of these things like predictive policing, but I'm I'm understanding that that's we've crossed all these lines. They're 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 all going to be with us for a very long time, and we don't even know what else is uh, maybe coming. So at this point, let me um, 
uh, besides the robots, right? Um, uh, let me open this to uh, to an open session. Some of you uh, might have very specific questions on on some of these specific issues or more broader ones, and uh, and Dunia is also sitting over here at the front, and she's also happy to take uh, some questions. So let me just have a feel of the of the crowd. Uh, first uh, to see what we do uh, with with all the hands here um, okay so I have a very I have a decent amount of hands I'm going to start from the back uh, and I had a couple of hands just over there on the on the right hand side yes yes please with long hair yes thank you uh, first of all, I just want to say that I'm really grateful that we have women talking about technology here in Herty. Mm -hmm. I need to say it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, and second, I, my, my question is about how technology is also related to human rights, uh, to enterprises being uh, held accountable for human rights violation. So how is the legislation going uh, forward towards actually holding accountable enterprise by violating human rights uh, through technology or to other types of violations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I think I'll take a few more. I think you, you noted that one and people might decide which one they're actually taking. And I have a, have a hand at the back. Uh, yes, I have quite a few, but curly hair. Could I, I excuse me for uh, predictive whatever, uh, you know. Yeah. Profiling you, I will be. I will be profiling you here. Kind of problem. Um, okay, so I just want to follow up on Nani's question. Like w you talked about, we need to ensure that the tech is used in a way that allows for human rights respect, and we need to make sure that they're accountable. Where accountable, who is gonna enforce that? They're accountable to whom? And if we want to talk about the European. I mean, the EU. We, if you take Egypt, for example, or Turkey. I mean. Um, the EU supports these governments. Um, the Egyptian government, for example, uses technology that are sold from France, then UAE, then it's gifted to Egypt to um, track activists, to jail them, to do all of that. So who is actually enforcing what? And like, are we enforcing by the left hand and then we're giving tools to crack down on journalism and journalists and activists with the right hand? So. Thank you. Let me take one more, and I'll take a male question. <laughs> yes. uh, red uh, checkered shirt. Hi, sorry. Uh, my name is Jash, and I'm a student at the Hurdy School. Um, I had a question to Nani on the aspect of the design of internet. So you mentioned. The, illustrated with the example of Amazon. And so I was wondering, in this sort of age of using predictive tools for uh, predictive policing tools, what can be some uh, policy responses towards making machine learning more human? Uh, so uh, especially because you have in insurance, you have tools which might make distinction between urban rural divides. In policing, it's been already seen that it, there are black neighborhoods being targeted in the US. So how do you sort of reduce some of these biases? Yeah, thank you. Do you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. We'll yeah. start with you. All right. Um, I can kind of address some of the second question, actually. Um, some of the work that we do um, at the Compra project has looked at how um, various government actors use social media and the tools to manipulate public opinion. Um, and we've done a great paper on this, that inventories the various tools, capacities, um, and organizational behaviors of these different groups. There are about 29 different countries that we inventoried in 20. Uh, 2017, and then we're doing that again this year in 2018, and that number has increased, um, maybe it's probably come close to doubled. Um, but what we see in that report is a lot of the tools of um, social media manipulation um, were developed first in the United States and under DARPA um, as a research program looking at how messages go viral online and on social media and what brings people together to spur protest um, and, and things like that. And so that research initially funneled like in, in the US was then spread 
um, across other regimes. And then you do see more um, restrictive regimes also picking up these tools. They're, they also learn from the activist communities that are using them to you know, protest and to express their freedoms um, and turn them on their head um, and you know, use them instead as a tool of oppression. So I'm going to try and to connect question one and two. <laughs> uh, so the accountability uh, of enterprises for human rights violations, right? That was your, was your question. Well, that's of course a, a battle that needs to be fought on multiple fronts, right? Um, that's not only it exposing uh, the violations in and of itself, so asking, you know, publishing studies that expose uh, um, abuses, but then also follow up in the policy sphere, but also potentially through the courts, right? Uh, so a lot will also come down to individuals uh, actually holding enterprises uh, to account. Um, there is some really good work being done in the context of uh, consumer. Uh, protection that has to deal with with privacy violations, for example, um, um, kind of battling the unauthorized uh, transport of data and sharing it, etc. There's some pretty good good efforts out there that have been successful and actually have led to companies changing their practices. Uh, on the issue of like more uh, nefarious um, uh, tools, such as, uh, for example, uh, spying tools and and and, and the corporate surveillance uh, gadgets if I can refer to it that way. Um, there are initiatives at the at the EU level, right, to try and stop the export of those types of software. And those processes are, are slow. Uh, I, I share your uh, slight frustration if I <laughs> detected the hint of that there. Um, but, but they are there and people are aware of it. And also there again, there are organizations that are trying to um, actually take companies in Europe, for example, that produce that software and sell it to regimes which they know will use it uh, to prosecute human rights defenders, journalists, etc., to take them to court uh, in, in the national jurisdictions where they are based. So th there are things happening there, and I think that the moment that some good precedents are set, hopefully others will, will, will try and follow. And Sorry, if I could also jump in there. I think some of the precedents also need to be set around data and like the Cambridge Analytica's of the world that use these algorithms to target potential voters because I would hate to see those kinds of analytical tools being bought and sold by nefarious governments to further their agenda. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, on the issue of uh, predictive policing tools, I think there are two questions in your question. Uh, one is about the tools as such, and the other one is about the linking of databases, uh, in essence, right? Um, so how to, how to improve that what was your question, right? So um, about the software itself, that's a matter of design, and again, of design choices. There's a really interesting uh, publication out there uh, by some researchers at MIT uh, who have been working on kind of developing um, better facial recognition software because actually one of the researchers there who herself was, was dark-skinned found out that uh, basically the um, software uh, the software's accuracy in guessing whether or not uh, someone was a man or a woman, when it came to black people, actually was just as accurate as randomly guessing. Um, so then they decided to try and kind of see if they could change the algorithm by just basically f feeding it with better data. So this is one thing that you should, you know, that is really important is the initial step is asking the questions like, w w what are these predictive tools based on? What what information has the machine been fed, right? And there should be more transparency about that. And I think that there are definitely ways of doing that without kind of, you know, divulging the secret of the the, the, the secret sauce of, of predictive policing. Um, but, but that is one, one thing to look at. Then the other issue about the linking of databases, that is just really something that requires very strong and vigorous uh, action from civil society and follow-up. Um, by uh, by um, by government subsequently. There's a, a, a case that was just filed just a couple of weeks ago in the Netherlands, exactly where they are challenging this, where the government has kind of set up this amazing kind of profile in which they link a number of different databases. Uh, and on the basis of some algorithm, they decide which people will be high risk for <coughs> fraud and other types of crime. These people will then subsequently be monitored in an increasing fashion, of course, thereby increasing the chances that they will actually be 
quote unquote caught doing anything bad. So you create some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. I really look forward to seeing how that uh, will go through the courts in the Netherlands and potentially also at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but yeah, those types of actions are, are definitely necessary. Thank you. Uh, let me take uh, another uh, round of three questions. Uh, I'd like to do another round later on. So uh, I have a hand at the back. Uh, yes, you just looked behind yourself. Yeah. And then I will get... Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, we've heard a lot of um, worrying concerns, and I wanted to ask about one potential positive development, and that was what you referenced is the GDPR, the European-wide uh, privacy regulations coming to, into effect in May, and uh, also in, interested in Ms. Miatovic's uh, view on this. Um, is it a good thing? Should we be welcoming this? Is it a positive step for privacy protection uh, within the EU? Um, or uh, maybe it's a mixed bag. Are there gaps? Is there something where, where some holes where it could be improved and, and uh, where would you see those? Thank you. Thank you. I committed to a hand at the back, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, so first of all, I want to say that I'm a software engineer. So about uh, increasing diversity in the, the software field, I'm uh, very for that. Uh, I actually have a lot of things to uh, somehow ask or say, but I'll try to sum it up to a question. Uh, you already mentioned that uh, like the technology, like we discussed about it right now, is kind of like the newspaper or the radio or the TV. So when you say uh, restricting it, would you say that actually those mediums has been well restricted or actually it had just been the better effort of giving everyone an equal stage? So if you want some rights to be, or some other things on those networks, actually sh there should be more effort in like pushing more content that is, well, helpful for humanity. For example, I have a friend that works in an anti-Semitical uh, organization, and they, he was contacted by Facebook, and they got like a 10,000 euro budget to advertise for people, for like teens, they, they are direct teens. So they got this uh, funding from Facebook to actually forward their like righteous causes. So maybe instead of limiting uh, existing things and just saying this is bad this is bad maybe just like do like a counter you know best defense is offense uh, kind of thing and then the other thing that i want to say sorry i'm gonna push another one is um sorry you already talked only about um uh, facebook but i was th thinking about maybe other technologies for example virtual reality and how that uh takes i don't know even like the well-being of humanity from it, like uh, the reality, basically, and how it's like, uh, uh, I don't know, offered as a good solution, but actually people are not being told the, the truth, and this is a technology in its beginning, so it's time to actually like focus on that, and yeah, and how do you actually know about the technology? Because you can see Congress and see how they're like lays, they don't know anything, basically, so maybe there should be more like software engineers in government. And yeah, that was my. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, there were two questions, I think more, mostly for you. I will take another hand. I think you were waiting. Yes, let's take that question for the third one. The gentleman. I'm going on a two to one ratio, try. Thank you very much uh, for this interesting discussion. Sergei Tsyoshenko for Eurash Civil Society Forum. And actually, so just uh, reacting to a question of another gentleman, so about uh, this new regulation. Um, uh, your regulation is actually a good thing, in my opinion. So, but of course, it is a pain in the neck also for our organization now as a civil society organization. So, because we don't have too many budgets, but I think it is a good thing. Um, uh, a question of mine is actually that also in the European Union there are different opinions on how digitalized uh, the societies should be. For example, the front, tri front runner is uh, Estonia, and I'm fond of uh, actually what they, they did with the country, and actually I'm also a fan of Estonia. So, but uh, and and but Germany is more reserved, I would say. I would put that way. So just, uh, so what is the future of this uh, big data? Which party would win actually in the European Union, Estonia or Germany in this, uh, in this sense? Okay, we have a quite a full bag. Uh, Dunja, we'll come back to you. Well, well, maybe we'll start with you. Okay. Is that all right? You'll get a, you'll get a mic from there. 
thank you. On it's working. Okay, thanks. Um, on GDPR, it would really be difficult for me to say. Uh, I do not know who was asking uh, you the question. To say, you know, if this is something to welcome or not. Um, the problem is, I mean, we, we will need to see the implementation. This is also something quite new because it is not, there is no obligation for the states to have the new laws in relation to this, so it's directly binding. Um, there are even attempts to say that this is going to fix everything, all the problems we have. <laughs> and um, um, also, uh, it is important uh, to mention that in the US, um, there are some scholars, but even some companies um, saying that they are looking seriously into um, the potential copy-paste um, regulation uh, related to GDPR. Um, when it comes to laws in general, and it was something that was already mentioned by both Samantha and uh, Nani, and legislating anything in cyberspace, it seems to me that even in um, good faith, and many democratic governments are trying to do so many good things for the benefits of the societies, but in this process, they are entering a very dangerous, I would say, zone of legislating um, for a good cause, and then it, this is used and abused in many countries that are using it to further restrict their societies. And this is the danger we are facing with all new um, legislations. Uh, you mentioned fake news. Uh, uh, we were uh, talking about uh, several other uh, attempts to legislate uh, speech. And then we are asking ourselves, um, are we entering um, a good, um, you know, uh, are we entering a uh, time when legislation is going to um, help our societies or we are offering a new problems to our society that we will not be able to tackle? And um, this directive uh, is, is something that I think um, the time will tell if it is going to help or not. Uh, but giving too much power to intermediaries and shifting the responsibility from the state um, and uh, not having judicial oversight is something that we are more and more facing also in democracies. And this is something we will need to uh, uh, pay attention to in the future. I'll come to you and then come back to you. That's all right. On the GDPR? On the GDPR. Okay. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> we shall see. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a potentially helpful tool um, to protect. Uh, our data and uh, our individual rights. There's a lot that needs to be clarified. That's that's all. And uh, a lot, indeed, as as, as Dunya uh, mentioned, depends on on national implementa implementation and application, and also how the courts eventually will clarify exactly what is uh, meant with informed consent, uh, what is meant with the right to an explanation when it comes to algorithms, etc. There, there's just a lot that needs to be explored. Um, I'm actually quite curious. Um, I think at the moment there are like two camps. There's the ones, uh, there's the camp that kind of takes kind of the negative approach as to like how are we going to, you know, use this against infringements, and then there's kind of the slightly more positive one that looks like how can we use this to advance uh, the, the scope of our, our human rights protection. And uh, I'm a little bit inclined uh, towards the latter, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, um, if I could jump on the, the second question there. Um, I don't believe that we need to restrict social media or the free flow of information. I don't think that's the crux of the problem, um, but I think we can design better for democracy. Um, and so that doesn't have to do with restricting information, but it has to do with um, more transparency around why I'm seeing the political messages that I'm seeing. You know, am I stuck in a filter bubble because of all of my friends and because of the algorithms that, you know, base their decisions based on all the other stories that I click on and read? Um, as a voter and as a, as a citizen, like those are things that I would like to know from Facebook that would then at least help me have a better 
um, and more healthy and more diverse information diet. Um, and so I don't think the answer is necessarily restricting, but more around these ideas of transparency and accountability and more reporting um, to, to users on, on the platforms. I'm hearing a lot of this sort of human rights regarding design uh, for software engineering. Uh, maybe that could be a course uh, of itself in, in design of some sorts. Uh, there was another question on uh, Estonia versus Germany. Would anyone would like to come come on that? I feel you on German paper-based life. Uh, I moved here in November. I don't think I've seen this much snail mail and forms uh, in in my entire lifetime leading up to this, and I'm I'm almost forty. Um, I I think Estonia will win. Uh, to be quite honest, um, I think th th the um, different countries will arrive at that point at, at a different point in time. Uh, but I think Estonia, uh, the Estonian model, uh, will win in the end. Um, the big question is like, what will the consequences of that be, right? Um, we've had many conversations with uh, organizations and individuals working on digital rights throughout Europe um, as we were developing the plans for the Digital Freedom Fund. And one of the questions we were asking is, what do you expect to be working on three, five, ten years from now, which is light years, of course, when it comes to technolo technological development. And um, I, re I very much recall that uh, one of the points of feedback that we got actually was like, I don't think that 10 years from now, we'll still be talking about data collection, actually. The debate will then, like, we will have lost that battle, and the debate will actually be how are those data kept? How are they safeguarded? What are the responsibilities for those that um, that maintain them for us? And what are your rights to access, et cetera? Which in a way was kind of, yeah, slightly, depressing view if you think of the fact that we're now actually trying to curtail the collection of data as much as possible. And I'm not saying that we should give up that fight. Um, but I think that also kind of points more towards uh, an ever um, increasingly digitalized uh, future. But and yeah, if I could jump in there again too. Um, I don't think it's necessarily too late for the data collection thing. Like with the Internet of Things, for example, a lot of these technologies are just kind of coming out um, and manufacturers are starting to develop them. So why not think of new business models for these kinds of technologies that aren't based on collecting our data and selling it to advertisers? Like we have an opportunity right now to be innovative and think about these future technologies. And so that's one area where I think we could actually make a positive change. I would, I would, I would one up you on that. I actually think that at some point, uh, the uh, the fact that something isn't connected to the internet and is an old-fashioned analog item will be probably a unique selling point, where you'll be like, oh my god, you can buy a car that doesn't track <laughs> where you go and tell you exactly how many kilometers you can still drive to the minute. It's, you know, the same way that uh, uh, LPs made a comeback after the CD. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Okay, so let's um, do a final round of, of questions. And I know that there are lots of people with, with their hands up. So at the very back, I have a hand up. Uh, I'll, I'll take uh, that. And then uh, at the very front, I have a hand, and I have a hand here. And we'll see. Thank you so much. How we go? I'm humbled to be here. So first, I want to agree that artificial intelligence threatens human rights. That is a fact to me. And it's not just that uh, it threatens my right to work or being employed, but it threatens my right to privacy and expression. But then here comes the problem when your very own government, okay, governments have the responsibility to have our information when it comes to issues of national identity like that. But then when you have a government that has no resources to handle that, so they hire a private company to handle that information, how can private citizens organize themselves to protect themselves when their government has no capacity to protect them? And when there is lack of judicial oversight in the country when institutions of implementation are failing, how should citizens organize themselves to protect themselves? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, what did I do? Okay, we'll do four questions, okay? I'm negotiating, but they have to be short. Okay, short. Um, Nani, coming back to you to the point of the robots and litigation and the people who uh, program the machines and the software. 
Um, there is this uh, development in the European Union as well of uh, giving legal personhood to robots, which then will give the manufacturers and the companies who produce that stuff to say, hey, I'm not responsible for what this machine is doing. G you know, if you want to sue somebody, sue the robot, not me. It's not, not to me, not the programmer, software engineer has no responsibility anymore. I'm very worried about that development. So I would like to hear your opinion on that, please. Um, my name is Thomas. I would also like to raise a new point of view. That is when the Zuckerberg hearing uh, was touching the questions to um, limit hate speech and IS propaganda, and he said he could take out automatically by uh, artificial intelligence already 99% of all IS propaganda, and he said it will take another five to 10 years uh, to take down automatically any of that uh, kind of, of hate speech. Isn't there also a responsibility by the government to protect, um, since we are not able to survey um, risks uh, that are maybe dangerous to our health and, and life um, in an automated way. So that there's also, I think, um, a double blind, uh, securing freedom on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, try to uh, look into very uh, dangerous minds, one, one point. And, and then the other uh, question was uh, also to Dunya. Um, we were calling for transparency and the one person that um, provided uh, transparency, WikiLeaks, Assange, is still um, held uh, illegally uh, captive, uh, according to the Human Rights Council. And th he's even cut off uh, from being able to communicate and uh, be transparent and provide for transparency. So that is not responsibility of companies. That's responsibility of our own governments. And uh, so how, how does uh, your organization um, position itself? Uh, it wasn't mentioned that case, but I think it's very important to discuss it here too. And I have one more question there. Hi, so we are most used to thinking about the Internet of Things in the context of the home, but increasingly we're seeing a proliferation of the Internet of Things um, uh, in workplaces and the connection of wearables to one's employer, potentially through uh, employee benefit programs. So I was wondering if any of you had thoughts on the uh, ramification of um, all of these issues on uh, labor rights or any of the other categories of rights that we are not as inclined to draw immediate connections to when we refer to digital human rights. Thank you. So. Who would like to start uh, this time? I can start, sure. Um, I can go to the AI question. Um, I think, you know, because AI is so technical, it's this thing that a lot of people don't understand how it works. It's just kind of this magic thing that makes decisions and voila, uh, we have Facebook uh, taking down terrorist content. Um, uh, I think AI is very much a double-edged sword, as you've described it. But as the platforms innovate and get better with their AI tools, so do the bad players and those um, more nefarious actors that are using the technology for the same purposes. Because as soon as they start to realize what in the content is being blocked or taken down automatically by the AI, the sooner they can change that in their own algorithms and then pu push out more content. And so. Like AI solutions to me don't necessarily address the problem because it's just going to be a constant upping of the scale. Um, and so that's why I think we need, um, well, you know, human moderation, first of all, is an important part of AI, and humans should also be involved in like making those decisions and determining what kinds of, um, and you know, making sure that the, the AI isn't taking down things that it shouldn't be taking down or pushing the limits to freedom of speech. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that it's not necessarily going to be the solution. We need to look at some of the more bigger systemic factors that are causing these problems and causing you know, hate speech and terrorist content and fake news and conspiracy theories to go viral on social media in the first place. I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> 
on the issue of, of governments outsourcing uh, their work to private companies, th that you know the liability remains placed with with the government, right? Uh, you raise a very important point, like what do you do if you just do not have sufficient resources? Um, I do not have an, a, a one-size-fits-all uh, answer for that, actually. I don't know if you have any ideas, but um, I think that's, that's a fundamental question that applies to many areas uh, of um, enabling citizens uh, to be able to exercise um, their rights and, and have a sufficient quality of life. Um, so I, I'm sorry that I, that, I, that, I, that I owe you that one. Uh, I will think about it very hard, though, because it's a, that's a very good question. Same, actually, for the issue of legal personhood for robots. I have to say that I hadn't heard of that, so I, I feel like I should uh, read up very, very quickly on this. Um, my instinctive response is like that's insane uh, to be quite honest um i mean that would always be a derivative type of personhood the same way that you would do it with with corporations uh, for example um my main fear would be that the lobby for this would be powerful enough though to get a couple of people to foolishly actually uh, you know um propose a legislation to that end uh, I hope uh, we'll be able to shut that down very <laughs> efficiently, to be quite honest. I think that's that's just really not the way to go. Uh, I, f I would probably be sure also that many m animal rights activists who have tried to kind of get uh, s similar protection, et cetera, for, for, for uh, people with whom, or sorry, for entities with whom we've shared the planet for a very long time would be very upset uh, if we were going to give personhood to robots. But uh, yeah, anyway, I, I, I'm just, Slightly shocked. I will, uh, yeah, I will investigate. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and on the Internet of Things and wearables uh, and uh, labor rights, that's a very good point uh, that you raise, and it's an often overlooked area in which actually a number of really important battles are being fought, particularly when it comes to the right to privacy. There's a lot of really interesting case law on like whether or not your employer can read your emails and and all of those things. So I probably expect that there will be uh, some really interesting battles fought on the on, on the on the digital rights frontier in the in the labor courts yes um so yeah that's one to look out for absolutely yeah yeah and i think you know what makes all of these challenges so tricky with everything we've talked about is there's such a benefit to having these technologies like even with the wearables and iot my doctor's office being able to have that information and be able to look at long-term trends about my health and be able to catch things that they may not have been able to catch without that data, that would be like so great for society in general. Um, and you know, the internet too, being able to connect us um, and to give us that new platform to express, to protest, and to express these other fundamental human rights. But you know, so much of these technologies also have a dark side and finding a way to limit the bad while reinforcing the good is very, very hard. I guess like the key issue there is, is is consent, right? An informed consent. Because if you choose to share your data with your doctor because you think they can do a better job in taking care of you, that's one thing. But if, you're, if your employer says that they have a right to access your wearables, that's a whole different kind yeah. of thing, right? So, yeah. Would you like to uh, come yeah. in there, Dunya? The first part, w part of your question was uh, actually confirming what we were discussing before, and it is related to uh, you know, the fact that too many governments are shifting the responsibility uh, from them um, to the intermediaries and really uh, pushing away judicial oversight uh, when it comes to everything that is happening online. Uh, if we touch the issue of uh, terrorism, extremism, um, data protection. Uh, everything is done in the name of security. And then you ask yourself, who would challenge you know, any government or the right of any government to uh, tackle these issues and to make their society safer? Uh, but what we see more and more is that this is uh, some kind of trend. And uh, this is definitely something that needs to be looked at. When it comes to the case of, of um, WikiLeaks, Assange, I must say that in my previous work uh, as the OSC representative on freedom of, me of the media, I raised uh, the case from a slightly different angle. Uh, when I raised it, uh, it was the time when uh, Julian Assange was still free man. Uh, the, the website was just established and um, the information started you know, floating uh, around the world. Um, I was looking at the issue of um, access to data 
that he was putting online, um, and the right of um, at that time for uh, big uh, global newspapers uh, who were actually um, informing public about uh, everything that he was putting online. Afterwards, uh, it came to the fact that they pulled out uh, because of um, you know data breach, but also protection of uh, sources and many people that were affected uh, with this um, enormous amount of uh, information that was put online without any editorial judgment. And this was an issue that I was tackling as the OEC representative on freedom of the media, and I also condemned at that time, um, U.S. Congress members that were calling for his uh, killing, uh, um, arrest, uh, and those issues related that, uh, to, to the WikiLeaks case. When, the comes to, when it comes to the Council of Europe, it would be you know, very inappropriate that I make any comments at the moment. I'm in the second week uh, of my mandate. Uh, but definitely anything that... Uh, um, has any kind of uh, human rights breach is something that I'm going to tackle in, in, in the future. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we're, we're, we're at the very end uh, of, our, uh, of our panel. Um, I mean, we, we've started uh, by identifying that the challenges are multi-layered, <laughs> multi-dimensional. Uh, the, the problems are, are, are constantly on the move. Uh, this is a moving target. Uh, we can't fix it uh, because the things that we're tackling with are changing. And as you were saying about the artificial intelligence game, whatever you do, there will be some sort of a counter-technological movement as well. Uh, so we, we need to, I think, keep the conversation uh, going. This is incredibly important and to try to understand these various uh, difficulties and dimensions here. Um, but I'd like to thank you all for bringing to our attention uh, the layers of issues and, and the layers of places where these are addressed. And they will continue to be addressed. And also uh, a really warm uh, welcome to, to all of you to get involved a lot more uh, in these issues, uh, whether you're interested in human rights or whether you're interested in technology or whether you're interested in neither. I think, I hope that you saw that uh, these issues are going to be incredibly important, uh, whether we want to pay attention to them or, or not. So thank you very much for bringing this uh, to our attention today, our speakers and, and Dunya. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to Haiti School as well. Thanks. Thank